Now, let's move on to the immigration debate. The Australian Today has revealed that migrants are arriving into Australia at nearly four times the pace that new homes are being built. So, in other words, for the 900,000 permanent and long-term immigrants that arrived here between July 2022 and December last year, there were only 265,000 buildings built. Now, radio host Ben Fordham today pointed out that this is a far cry from the government's promise to bring migration back to sustainable levels. In January alone, Labor brought in more than the entire population of Dubbo. They brought in the combined population of Moree, Gunnedah, Mudgee, Cooma and Yass. That's almost 1,800 people every single day. Now, if Labor was to continue bringing in so many people at this rate for the rest of the year we would taken a record 664,000 people in 2024. That's almost double the population of Canberra. It's five times the number of people living in Darwin. It's more than three times the population of Hobart. And remember, nobody voted for it. Very good point. Nobody voted for it. Well, let's bring in now Herald Sun columnist Terry McCran. Terry, there seems to be so many nation-defining policies like this Big Australia plan that was actually never taken to the election. Well, exactly, Shari. They weren't taken to the election, but also there's been no absolutely zero thought behind what's, what's unfolded since the election. We've had this massive explosion in migration taking place, immigration into Australia. Let me add to the numbers that Ben Fordham was talking. You put what's in prospect for this year, together with the numbers that flowed in last year, over half a million new migrants in 2023, that's that's about the population of Adelaide in two years. Wow. So we've really got... If, I mean, if you had any sort of planning, any sort of thought process behind this, you would have set in train policies which would uh, enable the houses to be built to, to, to house these migrants, apart from everything else in terms of the impact on the economy, on inflation, on demand for infrastructure, all those things, just the basic reality of where will these people live, mm. you need to build probably twice as many houses that we're on track to build over the course of 2023 and 2024. But not only have you got this flood of migrants coming in, you've got various governments doing all sorts of things to make it even more difficult to build those houses. Mm. So, Terry, explain to us why the government did this. I mean, it, experts are saying it was clearly a high immigration strategy to keep us out of recession, but the fact that there are so many more people here means we're in a per capita recession, means that there's, uh, you know, a devastating shortage of, of places for people to live in, and we're seeing families, even if they have full-time jobs, for the first time... Um, kept out of the housing market, out of the rental market and living in tents? Well, there was clearly no strategy, Shari, in, in any sensible way that word might be used. The government clearly had this idea that if they opened the, the doors to migrants, this would provide the labour that was needed across the economy. I mean, we saw in coming out of COVID massive shortages of workers in all sorts of areas and particularly in hospitality, uh, and those and retail, those sorts of areas, uh, the difficulty of getting, you know, putting it very simply, getting enough baristas, getting enough chefs, getting those sorts mm. of people working in the economy because we'd relied so much on those migrants, on those short-term migrants, the backpackers, the students, to fill those jobs. So in a very simplistic way, the government thought if we open the doors, we'll have all these migrants flowing in, it'll provide the labour. It will also, as you say, boost economic activity because migrants have add to demand. They have to be fed, they have to be housed, mm. et cetera, et cetera. They, they use resources. But they had no way, they had no sense of, OK, we can do this, but we've got to manage it. We've got to put in place processes for controlling how many visas are issued and how many people come in each week, each month, each year. And mm. it's just got completely out of hand. And clearly, the numbers have accelerated in the first two months of 2024 on what were already ludicrously high numbers all the way through 2023. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, now, just before you go, Terry, I just wanted to ask your view on the bigger picture of our economy. We saw today that the Reserve Bank left the cash rate on hold at 4.35%, but there wasn't really any clear direction. Um, the RBA governor said she's not ruling anything in or out. So what's your sense? Are we going to see rates fall um, or is inflation still quite sticky? Well, well, Shari, I mean, what we saw from Michelle Bullock today was a half pivot. Previously, the February meeting, the Reserve Bank was talking about possible future rate hikes. Economists and commentators and the markets have been waiting for her to do a full pivot to start talking about rate cuts, just as the Fed has done in America. She didn't do that. She went halfway. She said, I'm not ruling anything in, I'm not ruling anything out. And I think that's sensible because the economy, in my judgment, is teetering. But it's teetering on the basis that it can go one of two ways. We can either see the economy hit the brick wall, and therefore mm. you would have to have rate cuts, or we can see a resurgence in inflation. It remains too stickily too high. So mm. that's why Michelle Bullock has, has stopped going all the way to talking about rate cuts. It's only a half pivot. We really will have to see how this plays out over the next few weeks. Mm -mm. Well, uh, I mean, the other benefit of her not committing to a position is that she can't uh, be accused of giving wrong advice as her predecessor, <laughs> Philip Lowe, was over and over again. We exactly. gave him such a hard time um, in the media. Terry McCran, thank you so much for joining me.